Hello. Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to Friday Nights Live from the parish. Um, this is our 10th Friday Nights Live. I can't believe it's been already that many weeks that we've been in lockdown. But I'm very happy that we can stay connected through our weekly Friday Nights programs with our audiences uh, until we can come back um, to our building. And um, I would like to, uh, to thank our sponsors who make these Friday nights possible. First of all, um, our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, as well as the Corcoran Group and Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. And it is my distinct pleasure to uh, be speaking to Jeremy Dennis tonight, an artist that I have known for a few years I've been working with. We did a project together uh, for the Parish Roadshow two years ago. And uh, he's also in our collection. And uh, he's currently in our first online exhibition called Telling Stories, Reframing the Narratives, which is an exhibition that highlights the importance of narratives to help us understand the world that we live in. Um, it's an exhibition that was uh, guest curated by uh, David Pagel, and it is, uh, it's featuring eight contemporary artists. So um, please go on our website, parishart.org, and check out the exhibition. It will be const constantly updated with um, essays and, and interviews with the artists. Welcome, Jeremy. Hi. How are you? Hello, good. Thank you, Corinne, for having me. This is an honor. <laughs> It's wonderful to have you. And I would just like to introduce you to our audience with a, a brief bio. Um, Jeremy Dennis was born in 1990. He's a contemporary fine art photographer and a tribal member of the Shinnecock Indian Nation here in Southampton, New York. In his work, he explores indigenous identity, culture, and assimilation. Jeremy holds an MFA from Pennsylvania State University, State College, and a BA in studio art from Stony Brook University in New York. He currently lives and works in Southampton, New York, and on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. Hi, Jeremy. So um, I have been really captivated by your incredibly um, lush and uh, almost cinematic photography, um, which really, I feel, captivates um, both narratives that are um, sort of collective stories, also from very complex 400-year-old history, mainly of Native Americans, but also I feel like that speak to our collective um, unconscious, as well as uh, I feel like you're telling a very uh, personal story with, with your work. And I feel like um, in increasingly so. And so I would like to uh, start with your work that is currently in uh, the exhibition, Telling Stories. And then we'll move our, we'll make our way backwards to um, some work uh, that were in the roadshow, as well as another project that you are currently working on called On This Site. So we're gonna show some images from telling stories. And um, I would just like to ask you, um, what inspired you to um, create this series, which um, you are naming Rise? It's a series I believe that you started in about two years ago. And uh, David and you um, both selected a few images that you wanted to show in, in this, uh, for this exhibition. So um, can we have the first slide, please? Um, well, thank you, Corinne. That was a, a great introduction and uh, description. Um, Rise, uh, I believe there's about nine in the group exhibit curated by David. And I would say Rise began back in 2017, even though um, much of the project itself is based upon an article I read about uh, Noam Chomsky, a MIT professor of ling linguistics. Uh, in his article, uh, I believe the title is something like, uh, Zombies are the New Indians and Slaves in White America's Collective Nightmare. Uh, so the article itself does go along with uh, the psyche and what we're thinking about, but might be afraid to look at or talk about. Um, so to me, the uh, title talks all about uh, zombies, Native Americans, African Americans, and I'm not a big uh, zombie film or TV fan. And um, when I looked at the article, I don't think Chomsky <laughs> really knows what they are either, but I thought it was very interesting that um, he made this connection where no one else really had. And it was compelling because uh, to me, it made a lot of sense. Um, 
the article was based on a uh, question that a student asked Chomsky in sort of a, a very similar to what we're doing interview uh, over the web. And um, what he basically describes is that uh, the United States as a whole and throughout its history is a uh, frightened country. And because of this, um, people in America love these made up movies and TV shows as an escape or as, an, as a relief to this terrible monster that's coming to get us. But in the end, there's always a hero or salvation. It's always a happy ending. Um, but his big, big benefit is that the reason, and plus the uh, reason why I created this work is that the American Indian is the horrible enemy that's coming to destroy us. And he argues that if you look back to the colonial era, um, even the colonists were afraid of these uh, American Indian uprises. And uh, in reality, the Indians were only here defending their land, whereas the colonists were the invaders. But to the colonists, it was never seen that way. So uh, <laughs> that's that's sort of a, a, a mush together and um, kind of narrowed down version of where the project came from and why uh, I'm using visual art to reinterpret history and uh, narrative. I think it's really interesting, you know, to make that connection, to be haunted with, uh, maybe be haunted by those who were wronged. And um, I think there can be a connection made to also what's going on right now with, with the riots, um, you know, a continuous wronging of, of um, people of color that is kind of coming back to haunt the American psyche and it just keeps coming back. And um, I think you captured that really, really beautifully in a very subtle way. Um, I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about this image. We have several images. So I'd like to, I would like you to talk about um, what went, what's going on in these particular images. Oh, sure. Um, before I talk about this image, it's good that you brought up uh, what happened this past weekend, Corinne, uh, in Mid Minneapolis with George Floyd, because uh, again, going back to the Chomsky article, um, he argues that um, this fear, um, just the fear of people of color, Black or American Indian, um, just their presence causing a fear might come from that whole idea of uh, looking at the history of colonization or looking at the history of slavery, um, the fear that the people that you're opposing might one day rise up and defend themselves. And so um, what I wanted to do is uh, start with this image. This is a good coincidence because uh, this is the very first image I shot for the project um, titled, They Came Back. Um, what I wanted to depict in the project and in the first image, just to see if the project worked visually, was to show um, the volunteer uh, model, who's also an artist. Um, I, I kind of directed them. And in the background, you can see uh, four to five um, indigenous figures in traditional regalia, one with a, uh, <laughs> a checkered collared shirt in the foreground. Um, and what's happening basically is she's either willfully ignoring their presence or she saw them and decided um, that they're not really there or she can't really believe what's happening. And um, one thing that was so compelling about the project just quickly is that um, there's often this theme of like indoor versus outdoor, one person at home versus one person kind of like trespassing and it's kind of like who's really trespassing or who really belongs, uh, which I wanted to show. Right. And what's interesting also to me is like, you know, this is like a, a, a millennial. So we kind of identify with her. We, it, she's also your generation. And, uh, and then you, you realize there's something um, uncanny going on in the background. And, um, and maybe we can move on to the next image and talk a little more about how you work. And um, yeah, maybe oh, sure. you want to say something about this image. Uh, this is a good one to point out because um, technically how I create these images, uh, they're all digital photographs and they're shot on a large uh, format digital uh, camera, uh, about 50 megapixel. So that affords me a lot of uh, ability to edit the images and kind of crop and rework them. Uh, I do a lot of post-production in my work. And so uh, what you're seeing on the top left in the background outside 
are two indigenous figures and uh, just where the foot, the foreground foot of the front figure is, I placed a, uh, a strobe light so that I can control the uh, lighting just like a movie or a TV show, how they have both the, the set design and everything. Yeah, and, they're very cinematic, your, your um, photographs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's really done in, in an attempt to make it more appealing or more compelling for the viewer to kind of like enter it as a story in this one still image. Right. Can we go to the next image? This is one of my favorites, the nightmare. Um, obviously, uh, Fuseli's night Henry Fuseli's nightmare comes to mind. Um, was that what you had in mind when you when you did this? Uh, so there's so many undertones here. There's an erotic undertone. There's, you know, fear, um, beauty, beauty. Um, there's so much going on here. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Oh, absolutely. Um, like you said, there is an erotic theme to the image itself. And it kind of goes through some of the uh, images in the project. Um, that that's just something that <laughs> you kind of like need it. You need its own kind of presentation to go through and talk about. But I chose Henry Fuseli's uh, "The Nightmare" because I wanted to link to this idea of um, sort of that old quote. I don't think I'll quote it correctly, but like, what does a dog do when uh, they finally catch that car that they never catch? Um, so in this case, there's that whole fear of this Native American trespassing, what would actually happen if they um, actually got to where they were going or they pursued who they were, who they were chasing. And so in this image, it, it kind of looks like this uh, indigenous figure is kind of uh, waiting for a response or being patient while the other figures kind of fainted uh, <laughs> in this very dramatic and over the top way. And um, the image the, the image that we're looking at completely copies the composition of Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare, which I believe depicts uh, sleep, uh, sleep paralysis. Right. Let's go to the next image. So again, like a scene, you know, at first looking very innocent, a beach scene. Also a lot of that, you know, could happen in the Hamptons. And then all of a sudden you realize something uncanny going on. And um, I also want to talk a little bit about how you stage these um, photographs, because a lot of times there are multiple Jeremy's um, in these images, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this one's kind of funny because um, just trying to get people to volunteer in the project, there's one stage where um, you're kind of placing them in the role of being very vulnerable. It's almost as if they're like the one person who we get to point fingers at for <laughs> kind of like being the colonizer, or being white or whatever you want to call it. Um, then there's the second step of creating this whole composition, which is a little bit uh, absurd and crazy. And this image on its own, um, we just went out during the summer. Um, as you can see, there's like a volleyball, a volleyball court in the background. Um, I, I put kind of uh, piles of sand over myself and that's me three times, like you said. So it's kind of like this very um, complex setup that you kind of have to convince other people to um, accommodate because <laughs> when you're there on location, it's just us standing there. I'm there without a shirt on, there's a volleyball and you don't really know what's going on. Um, do people usually watch when you do these setups? Are people like bystanders? In some cases, um, like, since there's so many people from New York City that come to the Hamptons, I assume that they're the ones who just pass by without any notice and say like, oh, that's pretty boring. But <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the other spectrum, there's people who like circle around the block and you can notice their same car model uh, right. <laughs> just coming to see. That's funny. So just to get it right, so you, so this is three times you. Um, so you just take three shots of yourself and then you Photoshop it into the image. Yep, so just like um, paper collage, which I love as well, this is using uh, Photoshop and post-production to uh, add myself three times, which just accomplishes the whole idea of um, kind of utilizing digital photography to its uh, best extent. So if I shot film, which has its uh, advantages, um, it would be much more difficult to accomplish this. So 
Um, that's what I really love about the process. Right. Let's go to the next image. Knocking. Um, what's going on here? Uh, so knocking, um, <laughs> I should premise by saying that the whole theme of the uh, the project and what's behind it is all the history of war, colonization, genocide. And so um, in order to get people interested or kind of like let their defenses down because we're all um, involved in this somehow, I wanted to incorporate some more humorous and absurd images. And so uh, knocking is kind of like that ding dong ditch or um, when, when kids or teenagers knock on a door or ring a doorbell and run away before the resident comes and answers it. Uh, so that's what's happening with a figure knocking on the door. And then the two foreground figures, you don't know once the door opens, are they going to keep hiding or is the one on the left going to rush towards the door and <laughs> try to get inside? Right. I like that um, balance of, you know, some real serious topics that you approach. And, and there's always there's always a humor in, in your photos and in photography. And I feel that makes it really accessible so that people don't, you know, immediately dismiss it or, um, you know, be offended by it. Where did you take this picture? Oh, um, this is actually uh, Yaddo Artist Colony okay. in Saratoga Springs. Um, so I believe in the 1800s, the family built this stone house that you see in the background, which uh, overlooks this, a, a small lake uh, and, at the entrance. Right, right. Okay, let's see the next image. So again, you know, always these these moments where you you see there's something going on. It's it's like almost like a, a movie still. It's it's part of a story, and I think that's what you're so good at. It's like um, you know, it's it's a screenshot. It, it's something in suspense. Something is about to happen. Something has happened, and and you're just captive. You're just captivating the moment, but also the story. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk more about hesitance? Oh sure. Um... I'm glad you used uh, some things about to happen because in this uh, image hesitance, um, I think if you've ever seen a zombie movie, which this project is based on, there's so much violence and blood and everything. And so I, I really wanted to focus on that moment before anything actually happens. So there is definitely that threat, that tense uh, atmosphere and the gun being most present. But um, I'm also quoting going back to the history we're thinking about uh, particularly the Pequot War and the King Philip's War in the 17th century. And so um, up in New England, like Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, there was um, just mass violence and a lot of uh, destruction. But on Long Island, um, that didn't really happen as much. And so uh, being from Long Island and being from Shinnecock, I wanted to represent that hesitance or that tensity that uh, never really amounted to anything. See, I knew there was a story to that. Um, let's go to the next one. Wake. Again, <laughs> several several Jeremy's surrounding <laughs> a white dude. Yeah, this, this one, I, <laughs> I, w I wish people could see this one in person because my expressions are kind of funny in this one. But, yes, uh, I'm sure a lot of the visitors would identify <laughs> with, with this guy going, you know, canoeing here in the Hamptons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of my friends, again, from Saratoga Springs, and he was just so awesome because uh, I think he was only 18 when we shot this, but he was like so into making the image and he was so professional. Uh, it's only about like 10 feet offshore, but he, he, he got really into it. And, um, he has really good posture, I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, great model. And um, I, I love that idea of uh, the undead coming from the ground in those zombie movies. And so I, I wanted to remix that for this image. Um, even though this isn't taken on Long Island, it could definitely be mistaken for Long Island. So um, the Shinnecock Indian uh, nation is located on a peninsula surrounded by water. And so I wanted to remix that idea of the dead coming out of like a cemetery or from soil 
to uh, coming out of water and that same uh, iconography. Right, it's beautiful. Let's <laughs> see the next one. Towards the future. So it's more like a night scene. Um, towards the future uh, is a little bit different from all the rest. Um, I was luckily to get a um, female volunteer as sort of like the indigenous representation in the project. And what's so uh, great about that is I was able to represent um, a, a woman in what was called a Sangsqua, which in the Algonquin language means a uh, female leader. And uh, Sangsquas uh, today are more ceremonial leaders. Um, back in the 17th century, they were more uh, military leaders. And in, and in fact, um, some anthropologists believe that sunk squads only materialize in times of war. And um, there's other linkages to uh, women being the leaders of families and more matriarchal uh, systems. And so this one also feels a little bit more um, intentional in terms of an organized uh, uprising or a conscience um, sort of mission or intention. And so um, one other artist I was inspired by is uh, Dred Scott, his uh, slave rebellion yep. reenactment. Mm -hmm. And so to me to see this image is so amazing because there is no, there to me there is no real like Algonquin, Long Island, New England uh, images of um, men following a woman into battle or having this um, symbology. So to me, it's empowering to see. So you're creating that, that history. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Let's see the next image. Mall. So mall is a very American phenomenon. And um, yeah, what is, so there's a guy standing up there and um, what, what is your story here? Oh, um, I should have prepared more to talk about this one now that, <laughs> now that you uh, told me the title. Uh, the titles are actually um, much more recent. I usually just do untitled until like when I want to show them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, now that you said mall, I'm thinking about like the origin of zombies and how um, like more generally, when you think of a zombie, you think of like a, a mindless consumer of things. Um, I also wanted to title this image mall because in my head, from my experience, I know this is a uh, industrial, um, <laughs> an industrial uh, laundromat. And so I, I kind of wanted to change my mind and try to eventually remember it as a mall instead of that. But um, the reason why I, I set out to create this image is because in my generation, the uh, zombie movie that we all know is uh, Dawn of the Dead, which takes place at a, at a mall. And they all like write, write uh, SOS signs on the roof. They, they loot all the shops to survive. And it's all dramatic. And so um, I had to create this image because it's kind of like the very first image that you would post, that you would make a poster out of or this is the image I would show volunteers to show them what I was uh, trying to accomplish in the project. Right. So did you have to, so you took yourself multiple times just to create that, that image, right? So you had to take yourself like 20 times. Oh yeah, I don't even, I never even counted how many times I'm in this image, but then there's probably two times or three times as many where they didn't work out or I was standing in the wrong place. Uh, <laughs> How do you plan that? How do you know exactly where to stand? Uh, in some instances, um, my, well, my cameras, I really, I really like the function where I could just set it on a timer mm -hmm. every couple of seconds and it'll snap a photo for me. And so sometimes I like stand very, um, with very good posture. Then I look back as soon as I hear the shutter, I take a step and so on. And uh, hopefully I'm not blocking myself and hopefully I'm not totally obscuring myself uh, in another position. So you don't have a photographer. It's all, um, you set the camera yourself. Mm -hmm. okay. But the, uh, the benefit is that I have a, a main subject on the uh, balcony, which I pretty focus on and then I, nothing else really matters from there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Right. Okay. Let's see the next image. Okay. So that was uh, telling stories. And now we're moving uh, to Parish Roadshow, um, which we worked on together in 2018, um, two years ago. And Parish Roadshow is really an uh, initiative of the parish to um, take art outside of the museum and bring it into the community. And um, usually we work with artists who then pick the location. And when we talked about the location for you, um, you came up with the um, art center at Duck Creek in East Hampton. And you said that um, it was a significant um, location for the Shinnecock um, at some point, but obviously today that kind of history is, is forgotten or not known. Um, to many people here. Um, I want to read a quote um, that apparently inspired you for this series um, called Stories, um, Oral Stories, Dreams and Experiences. And uh, apparently you connected with um, an indigenous, indigenous artist and activist, uh, Kanupa Hans Kaluger, who um, said to you, uh, there are no myths. And what I mean by that is that every story created here in the Americas is an honest depiction of experience, not to be confused with truth. Truth is a dead end, but honesty leaves space for the ecstatic and mystical. It's a beautiful quote. And apparently that was part of your inspiration for, for the, this series. Um, can you talk a little bit more about it? And then maybe we can go to the first image. Oh, sure. Um... Uh, Knipa Hans Kaluger, um, he's uh, a very well-established indigenous artist uh, and he's uh, pretty young and that email and quote came from a email correspondence from 2014. I was just kind of like cold emailing him out of nowhere. I was just like, hey, uh, I'm just starting out uh, basically in grad school. I don't really know what I'm doing. Do you have any advice for this one project I'm doing? And uh, the quote that you read is a, um, a short excerpt from a very short <laughs> email response. I think he was busy at the time. But uh, to me, that kind of calmed all of my skepticism that I had, um, just because um, from my observation, a lot of younger people in my generation are more skeptical about uh, spirituality. They're kind of like more technology or science uh, focused or driven. And so I was working on these images all about creation stories, uh, origin myths, uh, mythology and legends. And I was, I was just thinking like, are any of these like real or how true do I have to make them? Or how do I even depict something that you can't even uh, visualize? And so um, by reading his email and talking to him, I, I sort of uh, believed that perhaps um, as he said, these experience are are just from dreams, they're from visions, hallucinations, they're uh, totally valid experiences, but maybe as you read these stories or as you listen to them, they're not meant to be taken uh, literally, like as, as someone just like up, opened up the door and this is the story that they saw. Right, let's go to the, to the next image. And um, well, I think, you know, mythology all over the world, you will find, you will find similarities, um, you know, in, in the deeper truth or the message, you know, about humanity, about how people um, behave or should behave. And, and you will find a lot of connections um, in these legends um, from different cultures. And um, I think there's some of that what, that, what you're doing in your, in your work as well. But um, let's just look at some of those that you have created for that series. Sure. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that too, because um, most people who know anything about mythology are almost nothing at all. They know uh, Joseph Campbell and his uh, research and awareness. And um, his most important message is that all myths in the world, um, despite the cultures, are um, all very similar in what they tell. Um, and to me, it's all about um, kind of empowering oneself to become something bigger, um, just to learn from um, things that we experience and just how to be like a better person in general. And so um, when I like to work in series, um, stories is something that started in 2013 is, and is still ongoing. And to um, hear Campbell's explanation that they're all kind of uh, connected in that way just kind of opens the doors to 
embrace the idea of um, bettering ourselves rather than kind of like isolating or separating cultures just because uh, geographically they're uh, separate or culturally they're separate. I was really amazed when we worked together um, on these um, photographs for the exhibition that, you know, you, you, you really um, sent me very thorough descriptions of the legends and the, the mythology behind each of these stories. And, you know, they're very specific to certain tribes, not only the Shinnecock. So um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, the several ones that we have here in the images. Oh, sure. Um... So when I started in 2013, I gathered um, hundreds of different uh, creation stories throughout North America. And um, some of the rules I made for myself was that I would always um, show the traditional clothing or regalia as an Algonquin or Northeastern uh, woodland tradition. So that's the um, deer, the deer skin, um, our unique headdresses. We use um, wigwams or witus or wikiups rather than teepees. And so um, in some cases, I was uh, reinterpreting like the coyote story into the rabbit, uh, rabbit figure. Um, so each region, whether you're in the Northwest, um, in the Plains, in the Northeast, you have your own kind of uh, deities and your own um, kind of anthropomorphized uh, animal uh, figures. And so I wanted to um, revisit these stories kind of as if I'm like a 21st century, like trader of stories or someone who exchanges and still wants to make these stories uh, still alive through, through their telling and through the representation. And so some people say, um, did I learn these stories growing up? Uh, I, I didn't know any of these stories until I was in my twenties. And um, I think by reading them, by learning them, it kind of changes your whole, whole world view and um, the sacredness of the landscape. I think that's interesting also, maybe it makes you more free to, um, you know, make your own interpretation out of, out of these stories. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the next one. So this I find um, really interesting, uh, the oath, because um, obviously, again, you have, um, you know, people in, in tra traditional clothes. And obviously there's a truce going on between um, these people. And at the same time, you have the, it could be the Manhattan skyline, which um, sort of creates a very hard um, contemporary edge to, you know, to the whole thing. And I, I absolutely love this, this picture. And um, maybe we can actually go to the next image um, because then uh, we can talk about your influence for that uh, particular photograph, The Oath of the Horati by Jacques-Louis David, mm -hmm. um, which again is something from the 18th century, but it's riffing on Roman legend. So it's kind of like almost um, several layers of, of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Louis David's The Oath uh, compared to mine, um, I uh, learned about his painting when I was uh, in undergrad in college. And um, I learned all about um, his biography. I learned about the symbolism in the image um, to sum it up, or at least in my interpretation, it's sort of a call for uh, the nation to uh, serve sort of like the common uh, people or, or to serve your nation rather than family. And in his allegory or in his, um, his storytelling, um, he's he's uh, looking at a story of three brothers who are going to fight um, three other brothers in a neighboring uh, town. And instead of going to all out war, um, three soldiers will fight each other to see who will uh, decide the fate of those two uh, nations. And um, the twist in the story is that the three brothers on the other side are uh, sort of the spouses or the husbands of the three women sitting on the side. And so um, in my version, I, I kind of wanted to uh, just focus on that idea of um, men gathering, um, just because at the time I was reading a lot of um, text in a book called uh, Native American Postcolonial Psychology. And um, just in my experience, there's a lot of kind of like individual questioning, like what does a Native American man uh, do? <laughs> it's, it's kind of like a very 
existential question, like what's their purpose now that um, there's no more kind of like hunting grounds, there's no more um, showing your bravery through uh, fighting or um, going to war. Um, and so in some cases, this even explains why uh, per capita Native uh, Americans are more uh, interested in joining the military or enrolling in the army. Right, and I mean, I think that's probably a very um, pertinent question for yourself um, growing up as, you know, Shinnecock, uh, being in this world and, um, you know, what, what you see as your role and especially, you know, as a contemporary artist, you are becoming a storyteller, um, you know, not only of tradition, but of, but of your own reality of what it is, what it means uh, today to be um, both a Shinnecock and an American and a citizen of the world, I guess. It's, it's very complex. Yeah, um, well, I think more as time passes, I'm trying to uh, figure out <laughs> the answer to your question, but um, I didn't realize it at the time, but back in 2010, when the uh, Shinnecock Indian Nation received its uh, federal recognition title, which um, after decades of uh, proving our continued existence, our um, family tree and continued presence uh, in Southampton, we finally got um, the United States to recognize us as a, a sort of sovereign and self-governing uh, entity. And so uh, to me, I, I didn't realize it back in 2010, but more recently I thought, um, this is such a great thing as an artist to kind of uh, work around just the idea that now that we're recognized, we're kind of like a very small country within a country. Um, the reservation's only 800 square acres, but I still see us as kind of like this powerful entity that has the same power and the same um, sort of goals as the United States, just to be um, kind of self-sufficient in that way. And so um, I think about myself as an individual and like, the Venice Biennale and how um, each country kind of sends their own representations and uh, perhaps I'm, I'm hoping to see myself in that way representing Shinnecock and so um, there is a lot going on there but <laughs> that, that's how I see it. Yeah and I mean I, I, I find it uh, of incredible richness to that we are so lucky to be so close uh, to the reservation and also be close to um, Many people from the reservation, including you, your mom, you know, your family is very involved in the arts and, and you are, you know, you're creating bridges um, between these uh, different cultures and um, between different interests as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's, let's go on to the next image. This um, is also a really very powerful image. Um, can you talk about that? Oh, sure. Um, I don't know why, but a lot of people very much connect with this image and I feel it's powerful too. Um, I love how it, how it looks visually and um, just technically it, it was shot kind of like as an impossible um, situation. Um, uh, well, it's I a bit like magic realism, I think uh, more than in other uh, photos of yours. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, just to be brief about what the story is behind this image, uh, the moon person too um, talks about the moon as this entity um, becoming a, a human in form and the moon used to uh, visit the people in North America and just kind of spend time and um, kind of socialize but one day a child with a muddied uh, hand put their uh, hand on the dress of the moon and so the moon decided to leave the earth forever. But the cool thing about the story is that um, on some nights they say you can still see the moon, the, uh, the handprint of the child on the moon in certain cycles. Um, so I, I love it when um, these timeless stories still relate to us in the 21st century and we can still enjoy them. I do too. And I, I believe you said you made that cloth that the woman is wearing. Uh, so that, um, was commissioned by a uh, Northeastern uh, crafts person. Okay, great. Let's go to the next image. 
The stone coats, I'm very happy to say we have this in the parish collection. Um, again, these are two versions of you. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think this is a story from, this is from a different tribe, right? Mm -hmm. So this is still from the Algonquin region, but um, this is a image based on um, two stone giants which, um, like you said, these are two self-portraits with a lot of post-production. And uh, this was a time before, uh, before grad school and after undergrad where I didn't really have any, <laughs> any resources, any locations, really any equipment. And so using the best of what I had, I just uh, did a selfie with something that we all do all the time, I think. And um, one thing that people always miss is the uh, little figure hiding in the tree as part of the story, um, putting it all together. <laughs> so someone's asking, where does the Moonchild tale come, come from? But you just, I think you just answered. But maybe if you can just say it again. Oh, um, oh the previous image. Um, yeah. The, the moon person comes from the uh, Mississippi Valley, the uh, Biloxi tribe. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see the next one. This is also one of my favorites. Just a be beautiful moment, movement, moment. Um, the blue is gorgeous. Um, can you talk about this one? Oh, sure. Um, this image uh, was shot out in um, Springs in 2017. Um, I, I felt like this was one of the images that I really needed to represent. Um, because I work in series, I kind of feel like each image is a part of a whole. And um, when I think of um, mythology and Canupa's quote all about um, where these narratives came from, I, of, I often think of uh, dreams, dreams as a means of uh, producing new stories um, or as looking at, at, at an archive of stories coming from dreams. And so in this image, we're looking at um, basically a woman hopping out of uh, gas or a cloud. Um, and in the original story, um, she's appearing in front of an individual who uh, purposely induced a dream state to uh, see her. I, were you purposely looking for stories that uh, show um, powerful women or did you just come upon those um, sort of more by accident? Um, this one, I was, I did it more on accident, but I would say more and more as I gather uh, biographical information, I'm hoping to return to the series and um, do more images based on uh, strong female and male individuals. Wonderful. Let's see the next one. The interment of Pogatakut, Pogatakut is also in our collection. Um, again, I think this is all you, right? <laughs> yeah, it's strange looking at it now, but yeah, those are all myself uh, in self-portrait and um, kind of posing myself. Uh, in some cases, there's like a hand holding my own uh, coat there's right. a, a hand on a hand. And um, the Gattaquit is a really interesting individual because uh, he was at one time the sachem of all of Long Island in the 17th century. And by the time uh, Southampton and uh, Southhold, which I, both, I believe both were founded in 1640, uh, he was already an elderly person. But um, why, he, why I believe he was so great is that um, at the time, the English wanted um, the different native groups on Long Island to go to war against the Dutch and vice versa. And later on, um, different native groups wanted to kind of rise up and wipe out other <laughs> native groups. So it was just like a whole bunch of confusion and violence. And at the uh, behind all of that, the Gattaquit was the one who uh, didn't really want to create war with anyone. He wanted to be friends with the English and his fellow uh, indigenous inhabitants. And in addition to that, um, the Gattaquit was very hesitant to sell land to the colonists. But I, I believe after his uh, death, um, the following sachems kind of um, 
made that more relaxed and we're more open to selling land. Right. It's a, it's a very ominous um, picture. And, uh, you know, thinking of what happened to Long Island, it, it's, it's quite pertinent to, to the history of this place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, one thing I want to mention, um, we don't have the comparison image, but this is based on El Greco's The Disrobing of Christ in uh, 1577. And yeah. so um, I thought that was such an important uh, comparison because in that image, there's a, there's a huge line of people in that procession. Whereas with the Gettiket, um, if you're from Long Island, he lived on Shelter Island. And so at the moment of his death, they rode him um, across the water to, uh, I believe it's Hog's uh, Neck there in Sag Harbor. And uh, on foot, they brought his, um, remains all the way out to Montauk for burial, but halfway there, they uh, rested, rest his body for um, a moment. And this is what that image, this is what the uh, image is representing that moment of rest. And so for many years, actually, um, people would pass by there and clear the ground because it was kind of hollowed sacred ground. So people knew about this. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's on, um, between Sag Harbor and East Hampton near um, the Rock School. So there's mm, still, still a metal right. sign. Right. And people are still, they still know about it. They still stop there. Uh, people no longer stop there. And uh, according to historical accounts, um, because most of the major roads on the East End are from old uh, walking and wagon trails, this particular site was uh, destroyed as they widened the highways. Okay. Let's see the next one. The ghost of the white deer. Um, this one's really interesting because um, I, I really love the whole idea in mythology of um, humans turning into animals and having superpowers. And um, one thing that's interesting about the deer is that there is no real um, kind of <laughs> there is like no human form of the deer. I think they're just like there to be consumed. And in the ghost of the white deer, this is one of those strange exceptions where um, the deer is kind of like this eternal figure. And uh, as we can see it in the image, it's this uh, pure white uh, version of a deer. So um, whenever we see albino animals in general, we think it's kind of like a, a sacred thing or it's something to be preserved. And that's true in this story as well. And so um, in the end, what we're seeing in the scene is a hunter trying to hunt the uh, ghost of the white deer, but not succeeding. So it's also kind of something um, chasing for the impossible, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see the next image. OK. Um, let's move on to. Um, a project you've been um, working on continuously since 2016 called On This Site. So what's interesting about that, it's this is a very different body of work um, where you actually have usually no um, humans in, in the photographs. It's, it's usually about landscapes and, and specific sites on Long Island. So maybe um, we can briefly talk about that. And then I also want to mention at the end, we'll take questions. Uh, you see the chat and the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and just uh, write us your, your questions. So let's look at the um, next image. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's nice that you say that um, there's no people as just as an observation. Um, when I set out to do this project in grad school originally, um, I wanted to do images based on uh, Timothy O'Sullivan's photos of Gettysburg, um, those post-battle images of uh, soldiers lying on the ground with um, the mist or the uh, after rain fog hovering above them like ghosts. And so uh, I originally kind of proposed that there should be indigenous figures in each image, um, just as kind of like what they would have been doing there traditionally but that kind of uh, never came to fruition just because some of the locations are like so far in the middle of nowhere or they're in briar bushes or on someone's backyard. And so um, what we're looking at here in Sugarloaf Hill 
is a uh, 3,000 year old burial site underneath the foundation of that white house that we're looking at. And um, people always ask, what is this thing in the foreground that looks so mechanical? That's just something that people uh, park their boats on and uh, tow to the beach. So that's kind of irrelevant, but um, what's, what's necessary in the project is to trespass sometimes. So <laughs> that was my uh, vantage point for this image. So you basically trespass, you don't ask the owner for permission and they, they don't know what they're sitting on basically, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well one, when one aspect it's trespass, but in the East End, just growing up here, you know that people sometimes live in their house two weeks out of the whole year. <laughs> so yeah. When I go yeah, out to- I'm saying trespassing. <laughs> okay. But in uh, Nassau County, there's usually people home and they say, what are you doing over there? <laughs> right, right. Um, let's, so we, um, let's go to the next image. So uh, I put a little um, subtitle just to give some of the images context. And uh, I know we're running a little bit over time, so it's okay yeah. if we uh, skip Fine. these a little bit. So this is Sylvester Manor in Shelter Island, so, which was a plantation with slaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to choose this image because um, on this site, the project that I uh, started in 2016, thanks to Running Strong, um, it, it allowed me to access places that the public usually doesn't have access to. So what we're looking at is the uh, attic of the historic Sylvester Manor, where um, it's a very small and narrow crawl space that you go up. The floorboards are very um, precious. It kind of feels like you're cracking them as you walk on them. But in this particular image, this was the bedroom of Isaac Barrow. And what you can't see in this image due to the scale are his uh, carvings of sailboats along the window. And so if you were lucky enough to see them, they're uh, just so amazing to still see something from the 1800s um, just inside this uh, un unseemingly uh, attic space. And so uh, I thought that was important to share. Thank you. Let's see the next, uh, let, next and last image, actually, the mica tablet. Uh, so the, the mica tablet um, is amazing because uh, just to give a little bit of scale, it's about eight by 10 inches. And the mica tablet was found uh, around the 1800s in Brookhaven. Um, at the moment, it's in the New York State Museum collection in Albany. And they don't really know when it was made or who made it, but it's in the traditional territory of the Unkachag, who are still based in uh, Mastic, New York, and have uh, New York State recognition. And so when we think of um, kind of like artifacts or Native American material culture, we usually think of wam uh, wigwams, which uh, decay because they're organic and a lot of clay shards that are all in pieces. But somehow this um, very miraculous and detailed uh, object made it to the New York State Museum collection and um, I was able to take a photo of it whereas uh, before I started my project I only saw um, artist renderings of it uh, no one really had a photo before that. So you also took photographs of objects not just um, locations? Oh absolutely uh, I spent a couple of weeks in uh, New York State or sorry uh, the Smithsonian archives in uh, Suitland, Maryland. So I uh, photographed every single object they have, but they aren't as uh, amazing at the mic as the mica tablet. <laughs> it's quite, it's quite am amazing. We have a few questions here um, and someone is asking, are there currently ordinances against building over historic sites as in burial grounds on the east end of Long Island? Um, so in New York State, it's unfortunate because um, there's something called a tribal historic preservation officer who uh, in your region, they're meant to uh, be on location during development. But because in Suffolk County, real estate is like the number one um, kind of economy out here. And there's just like dozens of developments happening all at the same time. That's really impossible. And so people who are developing those sites, um, there's just probably endless stories of finding like a human remain putting it into the foundation or just discarding it and no one really knowing about that um, being there. 
but you also have to remember um, Long Island was inhabited for 10,000 years. So this is just something that you're going to find everywhere. Right. Stephanie is asking, can you direct us to the collection of stories you have collected, especially those used as the basis for some of these works of art? Oh, sure. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Um, one way to find them, I, I do have a book from the Roadshow that Corinne's uh, written introduction is uh, featured in. So you can find that on my website. You can also go to archive.org to find some of the uh, huge text collections without my images as well for free. <laughs> Great. And someone here is asking a question that I wanted to ask you to conclude our conversation. And that is, what are you working on now? Um, I feel like your, your work has become um, more and more personal in a way. And uh, I'm just curious to see what, um, what is next. What, is, what are you working on now? Oh, sure. Um, I'm a little bit sad that RISE wasn't uh, possible in person because being in, in the parish is like <laughs> the best thing you can have, like growing up in Southampton. And RISE itself for me is like the best project I've ever worked on. And so what I'm hoping to do is continue that project, maybe have it as a traveling exhibit. And if you uh, follow on uh, social media, there's going to be some big news in October relating to the on the site project. So keep your eyes open for that. Wonderful. Jeremy, I want to thank you so much for um, talking with me tonight and, and showing your beautiful work. And, and I really look forward to more and having more at the parish when we reopen. Oh, well, thank you, Corinne, for everything. <laughs> thank you. Have a good night, everyone.